definitely easier to tear something down than build it up. Because while destruction takes force and energy, it doesn't necessarily require a delicate touch. But picking up the pieces and making something new out of them? Now that's a trickier proposition. In 1787, America was in a shambles. After successfully overthrowing Great Britain, the newly independent states were floundering. But in that dark hour, they pulled together to create a marvel, the United States Constitution, the blueprint for American government. Give me liberty or give me death. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Ask not what your country can do for you. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. We the people, the opening of the Constitution of the United States of America. Pretty familiar stuff, right? So familiar that it's easy to forget just how truly amazing those words are. See, back when the Constitution was written, we the people weren't even really a people yet. In many ways, the Constitution made us a unified group. A Constitution sets out the fundamental principles and rules that govern a country. It's a plan that helps people live together by spelling out how laws are made and enforced. The Constitution of the United States is a written document. It lays out the basic structures, processes, and functions of our government. And for the American people, it is far more than just another piece of paper. The Constitution is really alive and it's kicking in and it's influencing everything almost. It's kind of helping um, keep everything equal for me and also for my future. The Constitution is kind of a blueprint of what our government's supposed to be like and it sets the standard for American democracy. Well, the Constitution tells me my, my rights. What unites us is not a single religion or a long history, a similarity of ethnic groups, but rather it is that document created over 200 years ago that defines our rights and responsibilities as citizens. And that's not all. Order today and along with your fabulous constitution you'll also get the Bill of Rights. That's right, the brainchild of perhaps the finest minds of any American generation. The Bill of Rights protects all of those inalienable rights, those rights you were born with. Things like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, due process, and much, much more. And it's all for the low, low price of citizenship. Whoa, that was very undignified. I mean, we're talking about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights here. Ah, today we have the utmost respect for these documents. But they were born at the most turbulent time in our history. Forged in hotly contested debates behind closed doors, the Constitution was a tough sell in the 18th century. 1781. General Charles Cornwallis surrenders to General George Washington. Against all odds, the Americans are victorious in the revolution against the British. Finally, the colonies really are free and independent states, just as they claimed in the Declaration of Independence almost six years earlier. The key word here is independent. After living with a king for 150 years, Americans were suspicious of big, centralized governments. And now that the states had gotten rid of their common enemy, they really didn't have much use for each other anymore. When you're thinking about the states during this time period, it's important to remember the fact that unlike today when we're all just sort of happy states in a union, they really in many ways were different countries. Thomas Jefferson called Virginia his country well into his time as being president. Southerners thought that Northerners were pompous, Northerners thought the Southerners were loud, and really Americans were not quite sure what it meant to be American at that point because there were so many different kinds of nations in a sense all with very different customs. No matter how different you are, it's a good idea to be on friendly terms with your neighbors. 
so the states formed a loose partnership known as a confederation. As allies, they wrote the nation's very first constitution called the Articles of Confederation. Some partnership. Under the Articles, the states held on to their sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Sure, they allowed the new National Congress to declare war and send ambassadors to foreign countries, but the states kept the most important powers for themselves. Like the power to collect taxes. The revolution had left the country with a mountain of debt, but Congress couldn't levy taxes to pay it. Or the power to enforce laws. What's the point of making them if you can't enforce them? Or the power to regulate business between states. Merchants were upset because each state had its own money and its own rules about trade. Many thought a single economic system would make it easier to do business both at home and abroad. Finally, in 1786, a convention was called in Annapolis, Maryland to sort out the confusion over interstate commerce. Sounds like a great time, right? Get together and talk about our dysfunctional economy? I guess that's what most of the delegates thought too, because only a handful showed up. Maryland, the host state, didn't even bother to send representatives, but sometimes smaller is better. After some heated discussions, the delegates figured out that trade was just the tip of the iceberg. The root of the problem was the Articles of Confederation themselves, and the guys who came to Annapolis decided to do something about it. One of them was James Madison. Of all the men who worked for a stronger, more unified nation, none was more persistent or eloquent. Ask any American. What about the Constitution and what, what the meaning of freedom is? He was a contributing writer to the Federalist Papers, which I had to read in class. So explaining the Constitution and the way he thought America should run. I don't know what number president he was. I do know that he was one of our presidents. Historically, James Madison has been overshadowed by his fellow Virginians, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. But Madison was a tactical genius who played a huge part in shaping our system of government. Don't go looking around Washington, D.C. for the James Madison Monument. Instead of a tower or statue, this founding father got his name put on a library. But in a way, that's fitting. Madison was a real bookworm. Nobody read more or came to meetings better prepared. If you were doing a class project, you'd want him in your group. After the Annapolis Convention, Madison went back to Montpelier, his Virginian plantation, and started to read. He studied every republic that ever existed, including ones in ancient Greece and Switzerland. A republic is a government ruled by representatives selected by the people, like the government we have in the United States today. Madison took his nose out of the books long enough to look around him, too. And what he saw was, people aren't perfect. They don't always act for the common good. When it comes right down to it, most of us are selfish. What is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. Instead of ignoring human nature, Madison reasoned government should use and control it. He devised a system where the self-interest of different groups would be an advantage. He may not have been as flashy as some of the other founding fathers, but as fourth president of the United States and one of the Constitution's major architects, James Madison was an American original. Madison didn't just read. He also wrote letters to all the movers and shakers in every state, urging them to come to a new meeting about the Articles of Confederation, scheduled to start on the 25th of May, 1787. In the end, 55 men from 12 states attended the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at what is now called Independence Hall. That remarkable group came to be known as the Framers of the Constitution. Even in such a star-studded cast, there was no doubt about who would direct the proceedings. For in post-revolutionary America, one man stood first among equals, George Washington. Abigail Adams once said about Washington, He is polite with dignity, affable without familiarity, distant without haughtiness, 
grave without austerity, modest, wise, and good. Washington was special. Not only had he led the nation through its long war against Britain, he had also returned power to the civilian government at a moment when he could easily have become something of a dictator. He embodied the ideal of trustworthy leadership, so when Washington spoke, everybody listened. His own wife even referred to him as General. Washington was a stickler about enforcing the measures passed at the Constitutional Convention, especially one of the very first. The proceedings would be conducted in secret to protect what everyone agreed was a very fragile process. At one point during the convention, a delegate was careless and he dropped his notes in a public place and left them there. And George Washington actually came along, found them, and returned them to this delegate. But Washington had a real temper, and he gave this guy a good scolding. Really telling him, you could have, the whole thing could fall apart if someone gets these notes and sees what we're saying. They even closed up all the windows in the meeting hall to prevent eavesdropping. Delegate Ben Franklin may have discovered electricity, but nobody had invented air conditioning yet. As spring turned to summer, things got hot, hot, hot in Philadelphia. And I don't just mean the temperature. As usual, James Madison had come to the convention prepared. He put all of his bright ideas in a document which came to be known as the Virginia Plan. It didn't just revamp the Articles of Confederation, it replaced them completely with an active central government, but one that had some built-in controls. It separated powers into three branches a strong executive, an independent federal court system, and a two-house legislature. Representation in that legislature would be based on population. In other words, the more people living in a state, the more representatives the state would have in Congress. Madison was very persuasive. For several weeks it was smooth sailing as the delegates passed various parts of his plan. But when a new proposal was introduced in the middle of June, the going got tough. The new proposal was called the New Jersey Plan, and it was introduced by somebody from Arkansas. Just kidding. It was, of course, introduced by somebody from New Jersey. His name was William Patterson, and he strongly objected to congressional representation based on population. In 1787, the majority of Americans lived in three states, Virginia, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. Delegates from the other states worried that Madison's plan would weaken their position in the federal government. So in the New Jersey plan, Patterson proposed that every state receive just one vote regardless of population. An idea that went over like a lead balloon with the delegates from the heavily populated states. In the middle of July, Roger Sherman came up with an amazing solution. It was called the Great Compromise. Because Sherman was from Connecticut, it's also known as the Connecticut Compromise. Were these guys stuck on their states, or what? In the Great Compromise, Sherman proposed that the number of members a state would send to the House of Representatives would be based on population. But the number of members that each state would send to the Senate would be the same for every state, regardless of population. And then, just when everything seemed hunky-dory, another representation issue raised its head. And let me tell you, it was ugly. Delegates from southern states, where most slaves lived, thought their slaves should be included in their state populations. But delegates from the north disagreed. They pointed out that southerners considered slaves property, not people. Why should property be counted as part of the population? Just as negotiations were breaking down, another deal was made. Called the Three-Fifths Compromise, it said that for the purposes of population tallies, every enslaved person was worth three-fifths of a white person. But such fuzzy math could not solve the deeper problems raised by the issue of slavery. It seemed now to be pretty well understood that the real difference lay not between the large and small, but between the northern and southern states. The institution of slavery formed a line of discrimination. Slavery was a terrifying issue for them to deal with in the Constitutional Convention because everyone knew it was the deal breaker. There was no way to compromise on that issue. Hammering out a consensus took all of August, but by September, the delegates had taken the 23 resolutions they had passed and boiled them down to seven articles. The Constitution was finally ready to be presented to the world. 
we the people of the United States do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. George Washington, who presided over the Constitutional Convention, said sometime after the convention was over that he had come to believe that the Constitution was more than a product of human invention, that divine providence must also have lent a hand. The best way to protect the Constitution is to understand it. The best way to honor it is to learn more about it. Right from the get-go, which is more commonly known as the preamble, we're told who has the ultimate power in this government, the people. We are the ones who are creating it, and it only governs us by our consent. All in favor say aye. 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 Popular sovereignty is the Constitution's first and bottom line. Hand in hand with that concept is that government is limited by the Constitution. The government is only empowered to do what the people have said it can do within the confines of the Constitution. I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So the rule of law applies to government just as it applies to its citizens. As far as how our government is structured, James Madison pretty much hit the nail on the head with the Virginia Plan. Governmental powers are separated into three branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. Though they are separate, the three branches also share power through a system of checks and balances. So, for example, Congress can pass a law, but if the president doesn't think it's good for the country, he or she can veto it. That's a check by the executive branch on the legislative branch. Though the Constitution was written to create a new national government, it preserves many rights for the states. Considering how attached these delegates were to their states, that's not too surprising. Even today, people can get pretty pumped about where they're from. Uh, my home state is Indiana. I'm from the United States, and um, the city I'm from is from Chicago. Montana. Uh, state of Texas. I'm from South Boston, Virginia. I live in Illinois. I'm from Iowa, and I guess it's the state where corn grows. Oh, California, greatest state in the world. A system of government that divides power between one central government and several smaller state governments is called federalism. Federalism wasn't popular with everyone. Those who were for the proposed constitution were called federalists, and those against it were anti-federalists. The anti-federalists feared that a strong central government would take away the very same liberties they'd won in the revolution. Thomas Jefferson, who was often France as our ambassador, was a rock-steady anti-federalist. He told his old friend, James Madison, there was only one way he'd support the Constitution. A Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, and what no just government should refuse. For the Constitution to become law, it had to be approved, or ratified, by every state. To get the anti-federalist support, James Madison promised the first act of the new Congress would be to change the Constitution to address their concerns. A change in the Constitution is called an amendment, and it's not easy to do. Either two-thirds of both houses of Congress have to propose an amendment, or two-thirds of the state legislatures have to ask Congress to call a national convention to propose an amendment. After it's proposed, then three-quarters of state legislatures or state conventions called in each state have to approve it. That's huge! Once again, James Madison did most of the work. From a list of more than 200 suggestions, he came up with about two dozen amendments, each designed to protect the individual rights of every American. The ten that Congress passed became known as the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment describes the core values of individual liberties. It says government may not intrude on a person's thoughts or beliefs. It protects freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! Freedom of assembly and freedom of the press. Other amendments limit how government may behave towards its citizens. The Fourth Amendment says that the authorities can't come and look through your stuff, search and seize property, without a good reason. 
The Fifth Amendment says that you can't be accused of the same crime more than once, and you never have to testify against yourself. The Sixth Amendment guarantees a speedy and public trial by jury. You know, for a document that was written a very long time ago, it's amazing how much sense the Constitution still makes today. It's almost as if James Madison could see into the future as well as into the past. In a way, the framers saw pretty far. They knew that they needed to make the Constitution flexible so that it could grow and change with the Republic. In the spirit that less is more, they purposely kept the Constitution short and sketchy. Since the day it was written, it has been interpreted and reinterpreted by the courts to fit the times. Like the First Amendment. Checked out the Internet lately? Freedom of speech is still a hot topic. As it was way back in 1787. Then, Americans realized that too little government can be dangerous. At the same time, they had to preserve the basic belief that certain rights are higher than the power of any government. What a fine line the framers of the Constitution walked that hot summer in Philadelphia. They picked up the pieces of the Revolution and built something entirely new. More than 200 years later, it still guides and shapes the American government.